Mom, Dad, there's no way that I can express to you what I'm feeling right now. My heart is full to bursting, except to say, I'm the king of the world! Hello and welcome back to Cameron, King of the World. Now we've already talked about the the rocky road that led to the filming of Piranha 2 The Spawning with James Cameron behind the camera and in the director's chair for the film under producer Ovidio Asenitis and how he was subsequently fired from the film and him not being shown the footage at all. He wanted to see the footage and he allegedly, maybe, maybe not, went in and re-edited the film and then there was all sorts of confusion and again, I really don't know uh, how you get, what version is on the Blu-ray or is the widely available version, if it's the Asenitis cut, if it's the Cameron cut that was released in certain places, I really don't know. There's not a whole lot of behind the scenes information on Piranha 2 and there's certainly no special features on the Blu-ray, so it's it's kind of up in the air really and um and as i talked about in the previous video it really does seem like there was only a few things that were actually shot by james cameron uh although he was he did apparently do some rewriting on the the film so i mean it's it's difficult to know when talking about the film and watching the film and, and trying to understand it as a james cameron film and trying to configure it in the the whole filmography of james cameron i think really the best thing to do is to just chop it off the beginning and just start with terminator and forget about piranha 2. it really doesn't feel worth the time to be honest with you but i've watched it now i would ne never seen it before i think the first time i heard about it was when i watched the alien quadrilogy dvd extras and the making of alien superior firepower they talk about how his first film was Piranha 2: The Spawning. I thought, shit, I'd never heard of that before, you know. And uh, and I'll talk about it more as we as we go along. Probably in the Terminator review, uh, when I revisit that film and talk about it, how I first got into James Cameron as a director. You know, I I certainly felt aware at that point of every film he'd made from Terminator, Aliens, The Abyss, Terminator 2, True Lies, Titanic. Like that was the that was the kind of the pantheon of James Cameron, you know, epics. Uh, and if it felt like every one of his films was an epic in some way, shape, or form, but then there's this kind of redheaded stepchild in Piranha 2, no offense to ginger people, that just just never seemed to really be available. I never saw it on TV, like there was never a DVD release that I saw or even thought of. So when I saw that 88 Films was releasing this on Blu-ray from, I think, a 2K restoration, actually, I think this is a... And it looked really good. Yeah, 2K scan of the original camera negative. Uh, I had to jump on it just to see, just to kind of, and as I was thinking about doing this series, it felt like a no-brainer to watch what is kind of technically James Cameron's first film. I mean, the reason he, like I said in the previous video, the reason that he is credited as director is more of a kind of a technical you know, reason or, or a legal issue, in fact, where Warner Brothers or a subsect of Warner Brothers had kind of a say in it, and uh, they needed a, an American director credited. And so a video Asunitas, he kind of just wanted to make the film he wanted to make and swiftly fired James Cameron. So all I could find out definitively was that Cameron had shot something um, out on the open water, and he'd also shot the morgue scene, which um, is interesting, because I can kind of, one, see it, and two, feel like, what was he thinking? But this is, I mean, these are the kinds of films he was working on uh, with Roger Corman, you know, these kind of cheesy, you know, kind of low budget B movies. That's kind of what this film is. And I haven't seen the original Piranha movie, which was directed by Joe Dante, who I'm a big fan of. So at one point I'll have to go back and watch the original Piranha, but I don't have too high hopes for that one either, because that in itself was kind of following on the heels of Jaws. And so it's funny, you get like a certain film that comes out in the in the Hollywood uh, industry, and then people just try to clone it like very rapidly, and they'll try to make their own version. And sometimes they'll be completely open about, okay, we're just ripping that off this film. Like a lot of the sci-fi movies that you see, uh, like, you know, sci-fi is in S-Y-F-Y, the... Uh, the sci-fi channel where they just make all these ridiculous Sharknado movies and they're just, you know, lampooning other things and uh, but you know, sometimes people try to conceal it. They'll try and they'll they'll try and jump on a trend, a, a kind of film that's popular, like Star Wars. I mean, Star Wars. Not, I'm not to go off track too much, but 
Star Wars 1977, and everyone everyone wanted to do sci-fi. Uh, in fact, James Cameron worked on a film, Battle Beyond the Stars, which is very much just like the Roger Corman, let's do a Star Wars movie, and you know, let's see if we can crack into that audience and kind of leech off some of that success. And that's the thing, it's, the, it's, the, it's show business. It's The business is in there for a reason. And um, Piranha 2 it has an interesting distinction of being a sequel to a film that is kind of ripping off Jaws, and uh, and that's where this film really falls apart for me is when it just it feels like Jaws light, like and not in a good way where it's like oh it, there's there's not many calories in this. It's like no there's no calories in it, but it tastes like shit, and you just think why did I buy this? This is such a waste, you know. And and I say that in in kind of a <laughs> as an analogy, I don't feel like buying this was a waste because the Blu-ray looked great. I liked you know and I just love seeing old films that wouldn't necessarily get the kind of restoration treatment, like the, the film grain looks wonderful, like if only we could get a transfer of T2 on Blu-ray that looks anywhere close to how natural and filmic the, the transfer for Piranha 2 looks, you know, it feels like the the kind of the, the, the scales of Cameron's filmography in terms of Blu-ray releases and high definition treatment is, is wildly off when this film gets a really good transfer and Terminator 2 just doesn't even when Cameron does a restoration himself and wipes all the fucking grain off the thing. Anyway, Piranha 2. Let me get to the film. So I watched it. It's not very good. Thank you for watching. <laughs> See you in the next one. Um, so it's about this um, island resort. Uh, is it an island? I'm not sure actually. Well, it's set in Jamaica. Yeah, so I think I say I've already filmed a video for the making of Terminator, which I think is the next video actually in this series. And I mistakenly said that it was filmed in the Bahamas. It's filmed in Jamaica. And there is a hotel called Club Elysium, and that's where our main characters live. Um, the woman uh, of the, the the lead female character of the film, played by Trisha O'Neill, and she lives at the hotel, and she kind of runs uh, a diving kind of um, activity group. You know, she'll take the tourists out and and kind of do dives and stuff, scuba diving, and they'll go down to this shipwreck. And that was really interesting to me when when the film first opens, and you see this couple diving down underwater to this shipwreck instantly recalls to me Titanic, you know, and thinking about the underwater stuff that James Cameron has been so interested in, in his entire, you know, career and life, that he, you know, really, you know, kind of used in The Abyss, and then also in Titanic, and then the underwater documentaries he's done, like Ghost of the Abyss, Aliens of the Deep, and uh, all that stuff, and, you know, becoming uh, the world record breaker of the, the going down the deepest in the ocean ever that he did in 2012. James Cameron has always been fascinated with the ocean and he's now going to be doing underwater motion capture for the new Avatar movie. So it was so interesting to me to see his first film begin with this scene of an underwater dive to a shipwreck. Now, there's a number of um, possibilities here. One is that James Cameron came on board to direct Piranha 2 and thought, okay, if I can rewrite some of this, let's have a shipwreck because I, I'm fascinated in, in diving and shipwrecks and we can include that in the film. Or he came on board and that was already in the script and he thought, oh, this is interesting. And then he, he filmed it and thought, this is really great. And it sparked his interest even more and informed what he would do later on in his career. I think the most likely of these three possibilities, though, is the last one, which is that uh, that wasn't the case at all because I don't think he filmed that. I don't think he was involved in that. You know, I think a lot the underwater stuff was filmed not in Jamaica, somewhere else. And again, I feel like he really only like actually was a director on set filming the movie for a number of days. He said that he was on the film for a couple of weeks. I think that includes pre-production. So, yeah, like I like I probably already talked about in the previous video. I've covered the same ground, but yeah. So, but I just found that interesting at the beginning. Like, oh, this is like an interesting link here of the underwater stuff that are in his films. But I really don't think he was involved that much, if at all, in that underwater shipwreck stuff. But uh, so there's this incident at the beginning where this couple go into the ship and they get kind of attacked by something. And you know, you know, it's piranhas. The film's called Piranha Two. There's no, there's no suspense about what this thing is, and it's this, this angry, vicious group of, what do you call it, a school of piranhas, I don't know, um, and it eventually becomes more and more of a problem for the hotel resort because it's in that area, and when Anne takes people out um, to dive the shipwreck, uh, someone gets attacked and brutally mutilated, and so, you know, she feels responsible, and her husband, who she's estranged from at this point, played by Lance Henriksen, of all people, Steve, I believe his name was, Steve Kimbra. 
he is like the local kind of lawman. You know, I don't think he's really the sheriff, but you know, I think apparently when when he turned up, like there wasn't even a budget for him to have like a, a sheriff's or a police's uniform. It was just going to be like a plain clothes cop, and and he really didn't like that. He felt like his character at least needed the respect to have a uniform, so he had to throw that together himself. I think. So it it just again I've talked about it before the production of this film just felt very slapdash and just thrown together to just a almost unbelievable degree and it's it's almost a wonder the film comes out anywhere near as good as it does uh, but that's not saying much either um, so you have him as the kind of the the local lawman and they have a son who ultimately doesn't really figure into the film all that much. At the very beginning, there's a very interesting scene with the son and the mother in bed, and they're kind of playing around, and, you know, he's like a 15, 16, 17-year-old kid, and, and she's, like, barely dressed, and, yeah, there's a, <laughs> a weird bit of, like, odd... Like, I didn't know if... I didn't realize that was the relationship. I thought this was, like, a young lover, and it's like, oh, mom, and I'm like, oh, okay... This is a very close relationship with his mother there. Uh, it was just <laughs> just odd. The, the energy in that scene was very strange, uh, considering their, their uh, familial <laughs> relationship, I have to say. Uh, but I did like Trisha O'Neill and um, Lance Henriksen. They're the only two people who are really... Uh, there's another guy who plays one of the, the local Jamaicans. He actually did a fairly good job with uh, a certain scene where he has to be very emotional. I thought he did, he did a good job. But really, it's it's Trisha O'Neill and um, Lance Henriksen who at least lend some weight to the film. Like, the, char- the actor who plays the son is very unconvincing. Um, there's a character called Tyler who comes in and he kind of... Um, woos Anne um, throughout the film and then she realizes that he's actually there because he was partially responsible perhaps for what is going on with these piranhas and that they've been genetically mutated and that's why they're so vicious and can fly uh so tyler that actor was okay you know but i think she did a really good job and i actually think i i, I it's strange because again i can't really say where cameron's fingerprints are but it felt very Cameron-esque to me. There's a certain scene when she feels like she's really responsible for the her student who got mutilated and killed down there on the shipwreck, so she goes back to investigate. And Tyler pulls her back, and they've seen that there are piranhas down there, and it's really, you know, that's the proof they need. And she's like, I'm going to go back down and take pictures. And he's like, you can't do that. It's dangerous. These things are out of control. And she gives him a proper, like, you know, strong-willed, independent woman speech where she's, it felt like Ripley. Like, it was just, take no shit. Like, I'm fucking, I'm going down there. It's my responsibility. And it really felt like an echo that would, would later materialize in the fully formed strong female characters of Cameron's future, like Sarah Connor and the way that he wrote and portrayed Ellen Ripley in Aliens. So, and even the, the lead female character in The Abyss, whose character's name escapes me at the moment. But, you know, Cameron's always had a thing for strong female characters. And I, I would say if he had any hand in the script, he probably would have fleshed her out a little bit more and given her that scene, which really made me feel at least um, drawn into her side of it, where she really felt uh, a responsibility and uh, and it was like negligence on her part that it happened on her watch, which her husband Steve, Lance Henriksen, uh, very much throws in her face. I like their kind of tempestuous kind of estranged married couple relationship that, um, that kind of very naturally kind of becomes a bit warmer throughout the film when they, they, they have to pull together to kind of, you know, solve the issue at hand when these piranhas get out of control. Um, towards the third act of the film, it's almost incomprehensible. And there are people who say that films are incomprehensible. And I just think, what are you talking about? There was someone when The Last Jedi came out, and it was someone who I really respect as a kind of a filmmaker and editor. And he thought The Last Jedi was incomprehensible. And I just thought, what, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, incomprehensible should mean you're not really sure what's even going on. You know, and The Last Jedi for me was a certainly not not to get into that film, but you know, that certainly wasn't, you, you can see A to B, every scene flows and you, you know exactly where you are. There's nothing confusing about that. This film is kind of incomprehensible. There are just moments when Lance Henriksen is out on a helicopter at night and he's like calling down to someone in a boat and then it's daytime and we're somewhere else and then we cut to the nighttime again and he's out on the helicopter again. I'm like, oh, is it, is it was it the next day because like their son is missing? So he's gone out on the helicopter to find him. And then, oh, and then they just, like, you know, they'll, they'll have a day of, like, not really worrying about it. And then he's out again at night. Or is it just chopped up to the point where it just doesn't really, just it doesn't feel refined in any way, shape, or form. It just feels, again, slapdash and thrown together. There are some really good practical effects in terms of the gore. In particular, there's one body that washes up on shore and, like, the eyeball is kind of, like, sticking out of the face. I mean, horrible. I don't like that kind of gore, but it was, like, really convincingly done. Like, great. Uh, I think an Italian... Um, 
uh, makeup artist worked on that. That was another thing I think I probably already mentioned before is that the you know the crew was mostly Italian. There was a lot of like you know, language barrier and everything, but that turned out really well. Some of the gore effects. Um, some of it looks a little bit hokey at times when they focus on it too much, but I think where it really is used best is in the morgue scene, which apparently James Cameron shot. And it's when Anne goes to see the body of the student that she, you know, kind of um, feels responsible for when he kind of got mutilated by the piranhas on one of her dives. So she pulls the body out and she's taking pictures and it's dark, right? And the, the, the cutting and the, the kind of the way the shots are laid out is that you, you see the body, you don't really see the details, and then you see, like... The, the dark outline of like a chunk missing from a leg and then you'll get the camera flash and you'll see it for a second just like oh god and you don't want to look but it's 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 almost like um like when you get that imprint in your eyeballs or like I, i'm not sure how that really works but you know when you see something and it kind of gets kind of burned into your, your your retinas for like just like a half a second it was that kind of effect where it was like really well done i thought in terms of um not showing it so much that you can see that it's rubbery or, or fake um just the right amount but then as that scene ended, and I don't know if it was shot over multiple nights or not, I don't know if, I feel like Cameron must have been responsible for this part. You know, this is like a day after the attack. There's his body and he's just like, it's, it's all like it, the side of his stomach and the, the center of his, his kind of insides. There's like a big hole basically, there's a big gaping like mass, mass, a big gaping massive hole in his torso. And there's a woman who probably watches the morgue at night and she comes in because she's caught Anne looking at the body and she kicks her out. And then she's like, oh, she's got to put the put the sheet back over the body. She bends down, tensions building up. She's the, the, the kind of the the sheet is is caught on the wheel of the the, the trolley that the body's on. Then the hand falls down. It's a bit of a jump scare. Like oh god, and you can see like there's bits of chunks out of that the arm and stuff. So she puts the hand back, and as she puts the hand back, you see the body out of focus. And then suddenly, a piranha, a fucking piranha, like chest bursts out of this body. <laughs> I just burst out laughing. I couldn't believe what I'd just seen. A fish. A fucking fish had been inside this body for a day. Outside of water. <laughs> waiting for the right moment to... <laughs> and I just... I couldn't believe what I saw. It was absolutely a tribute to Alien and the chestburster sequence. Then the, <laughs> the piranha just flies out of the body. <laughs> Flies out the body, <laughs> attaches itself to this woman's neck. She's screaming, instantly covered in blood, like completely covered. There's no progression of like blood spurs. It's just completely covered in blood instantly. And she's flapping around, the thing's flapping around. It's like biting her on the neck and stuff. She's on the ground flailing around. She's getting her neck torn up. And I'm just like, what am I seeing? And then suddenly we cut to the outside of the morgue and just this high window. <laughs> and the piranha just flies out the window. <laughs> It is one of the most ridiculous things I've ever seen in a film. I think that's when it re when it's revealed to you that they fly. I mean, or it's just it's just got a very you know a, a very high uh, ability to jump. But you then later see them flapping and flying in through the darkness. But I mean, it was just unbelievably ridiculous. The chest burst thing, or the the stomach burst, I guess you'd call it. That was one thing. You know, flat, jumping onto her neck, that was another thing. The way she was instantly just doused in blood, that was another. But flying out the window, like, what an, what an exit. <laughs> I just love the idea of this piranha, like, waiting in the body for for someone to come out, like, oh my god. Come on, just, just go wait for the right... No, she's, she's taking pictures. I'll wait for someone else. Yep. Oh, I don't know. Shall I go now? Ah, oh, fuck it. Blah, and he jumps out, and then he jumps onto the woman, and bites her to death, and goes, okay, she's pretty dead now. Let's jump out the window. Like, you know, it was, it was just like, I don't know. I just, I laughed so much, and that almost made the movie for me. And there's a couple more ridiculous, but it, it really, that it never got as ridiculous as that moment. So it almost, like, peaked early for me. At that point, I was like, fine, I'm in. Just give me more of the most ridiculous shit I've ever seen in my life. But it didn't quite. There's a really tense scene towards the end in the shipwreck where they're crawling through these vents, and the piranhas are kind of like batting again. And actually, it's really well done is the um, the sound effect of the piranhas. Like, the, like like it's almost like a buzzing effect, a kind of a chattering buzzing. And uh, and like, just like a big bunch of them kind of like swaying in front of the camera. And you'll just get like a, a brief snapshot. Again, almost burned into the, the retina for like half a second of just the, just the, it's such a hor horrific looking creature. 
with the mouth open and the teeth and the eyes, and it's just in front of camera, and it's just, ugh. It does creep you out a little bit, and um, you know when they're flying around and flapping, it's ridiculous, but when they're in the water, and I don't know how they got them to move like that, but it was actually really well done, and the getting into the grating and trying to get through, and the guy's getting his foot caught, and it was pretty fairly well done. But the overall kind of pace of the film is just... It, it's strange and when you get to the third act and it just seems to, to jump around the place, especially when the son goes off on this tryst with a with the daughter of the guy he's working for and it's just, I don't know, it just it seems very slapdash and haphazard, I guess. So I'm not surprised that Cameron disowned the film for many years and then later kind of admitted that it was at least the best flying piranha movie ever made. <laughs> the joke being that there probably hasn't been another movie made about flying piranhas and for good reason. But uh, no, I, I it, for me it isn't a film that is 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 very good, you know, uh, especially not great, and certainly doesn't feel like a James Cameron film, you know. Uh, it feels like a film that he probably worked on, but didn't really have much say in uh, or much final word in when it came to the finished product at all. But I'd be intrigued to to know exactly what he worked on, and to know what this this so-called cut that I've read of that he he managed to re-edit it himself for a different market. I'd be intrigued to see if that's different from this one, and maybe it's not as incomprehensible, and maybe it was, uh, you know, the producer, Ovidio uh, Asenitis, who, who, I don't know if he oversaw the editing, and just put it, I don't know, it just it just feels very unfinished, almost, the third act, it's the third act, met the rest of the film, the first two acts, it, it's, it's fairly well put together, it isn't incomprehensible, but towards the end, it just, it doesn't seem to fit, a lot of the scenes just feel almost in the wrong order, or something, um, but yeah, anyway, uh, I don't know if I mentioned in the previous video, but apparently Lance Henriksen had to do his own stunt when he jumped out of the helicopter in a certain moment and almost broke his arm and almost drowned because it filled his, um, his, his shoes up and stuff with water. So <laughs> it just seems that like, I think there was another moment when, um, him and Cameron were filming in a helicopter and they almost hit a boat or something. And it was like a near death experience. Like, so this film just didn't really seem to pay to, to kind of pay off really for anyone in, in any way, shape or form. But uh, it was nice to see like early Lance Henriksen stuff, and I thought again, Trisha O'Neill, she did a good job with a really not good script. I, I really commend her for that. Like she made the film very watchable to me, and the fact that she's pretty much the main character. Um, but again, you get to that stuff where she's trying to convince the 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 owner of the hotel about these piranhas, and he's just like, it's like it's the Jaws storyline where the mayor doesn't want to close the beach, and he doesn't want to stop the activities going on at the hotel because he'll lose money. But it's just nowhere near as well developed, and uh, and just feels thrown in there. I don't know. It's it's not the worst, but it just it just feels so cribbed, and so derivative of Jaws that it just seems like I'd rather watch Jaws, you know, and have a great story with great characters, uh, and and the story that's developed properly and is comprehensible towards the end of the film, and you don't see a shark flying out of a window. <laughs> So, that was my thoughts on Piranha 2 this morning, uh, which actually on this print that was um, put on the Blu-ray, at the end it said Piranha 2 Flying Killers, which I think I read was the UK title. So, I don't know if it was the UK version, and maybe that was Cameron's version, I don't know, I really don't know. Uh, maybe it's out there somewhere and I haven't done as thorough research, research as I probably should have, but um, anyway, it is what it is. If you have any, any um, information on that, I'd love to hear it. But uh, I, I don't think any cuts could really save this film or make it much better than it already is. I, I would probably watch it again because it was just a really good bad film at times. Uh, knowing that it was James Cameron's first film. And even, again, I, I don't really feel like it is, to be honest. But um, that lended some I don't know, significance to it that I, I didn't feel like turning it off. Um, but I, I, I try not to turn films off in general, so it's kind of an interesting thing. And uh, But with Cameron, I, I don't know because he has... He has quite a tendency, Cameron, we'll talk about this uh, in, in future videos, I feel like he has a tendency to revise his own history a little bit. So I wouldn't be surprised if he actually worked on the film more than he's letting on, and he just doesn't want people to know that. I don't know, that wouldn't surprise me, honestly. Um, I, I have a lot of trust and faith in James Cameron in a lot of areas, but there are certain moments about, especially when I was talking about the, the editing, of Piranha 2 when he talks about how he broke into the editing suite and then later on said oh that never happened I, that was just a figure of speech you know and then other people have heard that that he did that so yeah I don't know what maybe that's just a certain shady thing he doesn't want to admit to but again it's decades later so I don't know why he's going back and changing his story um, but yes yeah, so I wouldn't be surprised if he did a little bit more on the film but I, I really do feel like um, this wasn't really a true James Cameron film, but you know, it's, it's part of his story and it's, it's crazy to see a film like this 
and how he was able to transition that being for all intents and purposes as kind of the you know written on the on the page in terms of the credit listing and being on the poster director james cameron if that was shown on the poster or at least at the end of the film or the beginning of the credits directed by james cameron that he was able to to take that and then jump to something like the terminator and we'll talk about that in the next video thank you for watching and i'll see you in the next one